Hello and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 13th Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Uh, Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. This, pro uh, this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. I am going to be your host, Adam Getacho, the co-founder and CTO at, at Blue Edge Ethiopia. And uh, we are honored to have Dr. Bekkel Alamayo here with us. Uh, he's going to give us an update on the approach and management of myocardial infraction. Uh, I don't think Dr. Bekkel needs an introduction, but uh, uh, to give you a little bit of introduction, Dr. Bekkel is a, pi a pioneer interventional cardiologist in Ethiopia, and uh, he is also a, a local trainee to implant pace, pacemakers, the first local trainee to implant pace, uh, pacemakers. And uh, he has also worked in Addis Ababa University as a lecturer, assistant professor, uh, associate professor of medicine uh, uh, back in 1999. And he is a founding member and lead physician at Gambia Hospital for three years. And he has also worked as a founding member and lead interventional cardiologist uh, at uh, Addis Cardiac Hospital for the first 10 years. And uh, currently he is the founder, owner, and current uh, lead interventional cardiologist at uh, Gesund uh, Cardiac and Medical Center. He has been awarded outstand, outstanding uh, contribution to cardiovascular service in training in Ethiopia uh, by Ethiopian Society of Cardiac Professionals in, in 2019. And uh, he has published more than 20 research and uh, publications. Uh, I think this is a little bit introduction about Dr. Bakala. Dr. Bakala, uh, the stage is yours. You can unmute and uh, continue. Uh, okay. you thank you very much. In the coming... Uh... Uh, 45 minutes or so, I am going to outline uh, the management of uh, acute coronary syndrome in general. Uh, and uh, the emphasis will be, uh, given my uh, profession and dedication, the emphasis will be on uh, revascularization, obviously. First of all, why do we, why do we worry about uh, cardiovascular diseases in general? Cardiovascular diseases, we know that they have been uh, number one cause of uh, days across the globe since 2001. That was the first time we knew cardiovascular diseases are uh, number one killers uh, across the world. And uh, according to WHO, in 2015 alone, 17.7 .7, uh, million people have died because of cardiovascular disease. And uh, this figure represented 31% of all the global diseases. 7.4 being from coronary artery disease, 6.7 6 from stroke. And on the other hand, the other uh, way of looking at it, when premature cardiovascular days because of non-communicable diseases was considered, there were around 17 million premature diseases, that means diseases before 70. And of this, 82% existed in low and middle income countries. And uh, this was caused, like cardiovascular disease caused 37% of this. So that means uh, cardiovascular diseases, when uh, the, the, the premature diseases were considered, it was, uh, the percentage was a little higher than the, the, the total diseases. To, to, to just show you the trend over the last decades, like according to the Global Disease Burden Study uh, between 1990 and 2013, there were 
changes of uh, cardiovascular mortality, like because of population growth, there was an increment by 25%. And because of population aging, there was an increment by 55%. Whereas epidemiologic changes, that means better treatment of coronary artery disease and other cardiovascular diseases has contributed a reduction by 39%. But altogether, overall, there was an increment between these two years, but an increment by about 41%. And roughly 50% of the total cardiovascular diseases are because of coronary artery disease alone. And when it comes to our situation, our uh, practice settings, this is a data uh, out of a cardiac hospital, the first five years. In the first five years, those patients or individuals who have visited a cardiac hospital, like 22% of them had either typical or atypical angina. That means the diagnosis being most likely coronary artery disease. And in those individuals, in those individuals who have visited this hospital, by the way, there were around 32,000 individuals. And of these, 41% had either dyspnea and or orthopnea. The implication is heart failure, mind you. So unrecognized events and situations presenting with heart failure is a common encounter in our practice patterns. And this is to just put it in terms of etiology, from uh, that analysis, coronary artery disease was the, the second most frequent cardiovascular uh, etiology diagnosed, just preceded by hypertension with hypertensive heart disease only. And this is our current data from uh, Gesund Cardiac Hospital, whereby we have analyzed the first 197 patients that have undergone PCI over uh, the first two and a half years. And of those, 76% presented with typical angina. Dyspnea and orthopnea existed in uh, some 50% uh, of cases. This is again the implication of disease. These are totally, fully uh, diagnosed, established uh, coronary artery disease cases. And of this, you know, the implication of heart failure goes up to 50%. Now, how do patients with coronary artery disease present? Like, it's not acceptable to write down at the end of uh, a case analysis, one cannot write down ischemic heart disease. You know, it has to come in one of these four scenarios. The first is stable coronary artery disease or chronic coronary syndrome. And the second is acute coronary syndrome. That means with a constellation of unstable angina, then ST elevation MI and STEMI. The fourth is, uh, the third is heart failure. These are patients without a recognized, you no know, former uh, cardiovascular events, ischemic events not being recognized. Uh, they, they present in a state of heart failure. And the fourth presentation is malignant arrhythmia or sudden death. The most unfortunate ones come with uh, the fourth uh, diagnosis or the fourth scenario. So now to come to acute coronary syndrome, as uh, I presume that everybody knows, uh, acute coronary syndrome is a spectrum of conditions from stable angina and an ST elevation MI up to ST elevation MI. The difference between unstable angina and others is troponin positivity, whereas the difference between STEMI and uh, NSTEMI is significant ST segment elevation in the case of ST elevation MI. With regards to the epidemiology of uh, acute coronary syndrome, both MI in general, as well as STEMI are on the decline because of better management of risk factors and uh, treatments like intervention, whereas uh, non ST elevation MI is on the rise roughly stable, but uh, tendencies towards increment. And this is believed to be because of uh, better treatment of conditions and better survival longevity of patients uh, so that they, they develop, they, they would have time to develop uh, multiple coronary bed involvements 
uh, leading to formation of collaterals, uh, preventing uh, transmural MI or ST elevation MI. So the condition becomes skewed towards non-ST elevation MI. And additional uh, factors that contributes is better diagnosis of MI through high sensitivity troponin is also contributing to this fact. When it comes to our circumstances, like in, in, uh, in, in our patients, those 197 patients which are, uh, have undergone PCI with a definite diagnosis of coronary artery disease, you know, some 56% of them were visiting our hospital because of STEMI, followed by chronic coronary syndrome, usually typical angina with uh, plus angina equivalents, and it was around 37%, whereas uh, NSTEMI uh, was contributing less. When it comes to the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease, particularly acute coronary syndrome, like if you look at the, the middle, this is, this is a plaque with overlying cup, with fibrous cup, and uh, this is a plaque proper. So it can uh, go either to plaque rupture in the situation of acute coronary syndrome, leading to complete occlusion of the arterial lumen, and uh, uh, leading to ST elevation MI, or there might be without any uh, gross communication between the luminal melee and uh, the plaque proper, there will be denudation of the endothelium leading to, to thrombus formation over the fibrous cup, which is known as uh, plaque erosion. These are the two common forms of pathology, pathophysiologic uh, coincidences in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So this situation happens when the plaque becomes vulnerable. Coronary artery disease runs in crisis, like it becomes settled. And uh, in situations of uh, uncontrolled biochemical circumstances, you know, the plaque be becomes unstable. And the features of unstable plaque are one, thin fibrous cup. The fibrous cup, the overlying cup becomes thinner when it becomes uh, unstable. It becomes lipid rich. The core becomes uh, full of lipids. And uh, the number of inflammatory cells increases. There will be new vascularization uh, and uh, intraplaque hemorrhage because new, these new vessels that develop within the plaque are very fragile. So they are very liable for uh, hemorrhage. And then there will also be microcalcification, or this is what is known as punctate calcification, and uh, the number of smooth muscle cells becomes decreased. That is the reason why the fibrous cup becomes actually thinner. And this is because when, uh, in a, in a, when the number of inflammatory cells is huge within the plaque, you know, like for instance, T cells will elaborate interferon gamma, which inhibits smooth muscle cells from producing uh, collagen fibrils. And on the other hand, these stimulated or activated T cells would also elaborate CD40 ligand, which activates the macrophages directly in, the, in effect eliciting uh, increased amount of matrix metalloproteinases. So on one hand, the production of collagen fibrils is reduced. And on the other hand, there is increased degradation of the collagen, the collagen fibers or the connective tissue, the overlying tissue, but the harbors, uh, I mean, uh, facilitates the situation towards very unstability and eventually creation of ischemic events. So now in managing patients with acute coronary syndrome, first of all, what is our goal? The first goal is treatment and prevention of complications. And the second one is to minimize myocardial damage. So we, we, we have to, we should prevent complications like electrical as well as com mechanical complications. And on the other hand, one has to, from the time that uh, he or she contacted a patient who is uh, acute MI, must target to minimize uh, myocardial damage. And this is achieved through the chain of survival. 
The first one is earlier contact, like uh, the emergency medical team has to be contacted uh, very early. If you take, for instance, our situation, it is uh, very difficult and uh, uh, to achieve optimal uh, uh, situation in this circumstance. But I think uh, our health education and uh, everything should work uh, hard to, to uh, sensitize the society uh, toward this early detection of alarming symptoms. And the next is efficient practice, especially to shorten door to reperfusion time. And uh, this is achieved within the hospital. Once uh, we have contacted these patients, uh, we should immediately triage them, like if there is a possibility of intervention, for example. And uh, the next is within the cat lab, prompt implementation of reperfusion with well-trained team is another critical issue. So when it comes to the role of emergency uh, medical systems, you know, it's very critical. The emergency medical sy uh, system is very critical in uh, achieving two goals. One is one has to cost effectively identify the 15 to 30 percent of genuine cases of acute coronary syndrome out of the total uh, acute coronary sy syndrome looking patients. And the next important issue is you know, detection of other uh, life-threatening situations like aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, and esophageal rupture has to be made at that point. So because of this, the early contacting emergency medical system is very critical in the management of acute coronary syndrome. How do patients present in, in situations of acute coronary syndrome? Mostly, it can be identified by history and ECG. A combination of chest, upper extremity, mandibular, and epigastric discomfort, or ischemic equivalents like dyspnea, fatigue, and syncope are the, the, the presentations. So then, if there is a high index of suspicion, one cannot or one would not be liable to miss the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, particularly MI. The central point with regards to the diagnosis of uh, uh, MI is troponin. Troponin is a preferred biomarker because of uh, because it exists almost exclusively in the heart. This is limited to troponin T and troponin I, while troponin C is also prevalent in skeletal muscle, so it's not specific enough like that of uh, troponin I and T. So troponin C is not a uh, part of it. And uh, high sensitivity assays are currently recommended and they are well validated. And then uh, the diagnostic lim limit like 99% like percentile of uh, the upper reference limit has to be met to make a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. I mean, uh, MI. Then troponin elevations could be because of several uh, causes. The mere presence of troponin positivity does not make a diagnosis of acute MI. The first one is like when there is a rapid uh, a rise and fall, the classic situation is acute myocardial infarction being type 1, type 2. These are according to the universal definition of acute MI. Uh, there are several uh, categories, up to four, five. Uh, and uh, type 1 and type 2 are classically the classic, they, they display the classic rise and fall of uh, troponin. The other situations that may confound themselves with uh, a rise and fall are acute heart failure in myocarditis, the situations like uh, injury, the chronic injury of, uh, injury of cardiac uh, myocardial tissue with structural heart disease or chronic kidney disease, they just uh, display troponin elevation in, in persistency. So to coin a diagnosis of acute MI, as I said earlier, central point is troponin, plus either typical symptoms or relevant ECG changes or a new uh, regional wall motion abnormality displayed, for instance, with echocardiography. If we have uh, 
one already done before. And if we detect uh, a new one, then that can see the diagnosis of uh, acute MI or demonstration of a thrombus in the cat lab uh, with angiography or the unfortunate, the unfortunate ones would be uh, diagnosed to have uh, MI at autopsy. In the early management of acute coronary syndrome, particularly MI, you know, the setting should contain the following things. One is there should be a facility for proper defibrillation. Second, there must be the, the circumstance should have high flow oxygen, IV access, availability ECG, continuous ECG monitoring, medications like nitrates, aspirin, clopidogrel, maybe plus minus beta blockers uh, would be necessary. And the third, the setup, the manpower profile should be able to detect and manage complications like recurrent ischemia, arrhythmia, and heart failure. If this is met, you know, acute MI can be managed anywhere. With the next, the next issue, the next point is, you know, proper administration of uh, antithrombotics, particularly uh, the heparins, where low molecular weight heparin is chosen for conservative management. Uh, whereas unfractionated heparin is dedicated for uh, interventional management in others like uh, fondaparunex or bivalurin will be are, are substances to be used in conservative and interventional are alternatives for conservative and interventional management respectively. Let me just show you uh, a case. This is uh, an individual who visited our hospital Gizund uh, a week ago. He came from Ambo, a 65-year-old male, diabetic and hypertensive, presented with a squeezing chest pain of one day duration when he presented to uh, Ambo Hospital. And the blood pressure by then was uh, 200 by 100. Uh, but when he appeared after he was uh, properly managed with aspirin, clopidogrel, uh, heparin, and in April was administered for the very high blood pressure. And subsequently, when he, when he started to move uh, from Ambo to Addis, you know, he was requiring one to two liters of oxygen. But because of the distress of uh, uh, the transfer might have contributed when he came here, he was uh, requiring over 10 liters of oxygen via face mask. Then, uh, uh, and uh, the echo revealed anthroceptal and apical hypokinesis with ejection fraction of 30%. And overnight, we just focused on uh, administer, we just continued medications like the antithrombotic. Uh, inoxaparin was continued, aspirin and clopidogrel were continued, but the focus was proper diuresis. After a proper diuresis in the morning, he was just requiring a liter of oxygen and we, 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 we could uh, comfortably take him to the cutler and we found out uh, this, this finding. Uh, it seems to be okay, like for instance, uh, there seems to be a, a very good, maybe if interventional cardiologists are around, there seems to be a good landing zone at the, uh, just uh, distal to the ostium of uh, the osteal lady, but uh, unfortunately, this is a realistic picture. You see, this is a, uh, a small uh, marginal branch from uh, uh, the circumflex. Otherwise, the lesion starts just from the left main with a classic osteal uh, manifestation. Then uh, we started to work on it. This is ballooning. And then after uh, the balloon, the, the, the artery is uh, fairly opened, uh, but still uh, it requires further look. This is uh, when it was being stented. And uh, this was the final result of that particular uh, individual. So now, what about, now let's, let's just, let's, uh, just uh, focus on uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome dividing. The management of acute coronary syndrome is divided into non-ST and ST elevation. 
When it comes to non-ST elevation MI, that means uh, composing both unstable angina and uh, non-ST elevation MI. Uh, the issue, the issue of revascularization is complicated by uh, whether it's universally applicable or selectively applicable. That means invasive versus ischemia guided strategy is critically important, unlike STEMI, whereby everybody should be intervened whenever possible. So the advantages of early intervention in, in, in non-ST acute coronary syndrome are one, one can rapidly uh, define the problem uh, through characterization. Two, early, revascular, early revascularization could prevent further complications and facilitation of earlier discharge is an advantage. But, but, and then it can be applied as early or delayed invasive. You know, when, when these two strategies were compared, uh, the complication rate or the event rate was, fair, you know, uh, barely better with invasive strategy as a whole, when the entire spectrum of patients was considered. But when that was divided uh, risk-wise, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, you know, the difference seems to be limited to those individuals with high risk. And uh, this is a constellation of DAISY and MI that seems to be uh, very different between invasive and an invasive strategy uh, in high-risk patients. So, uh, in conclusion, routine invasive strategy does not reduce all-cause mortality, and it may increase complication rate, but it reduces composite ischemic endpoints. That means recurrent EMI, recurrent ischemia. And unfortunately, these studies are done before the radial axis that has improved the circumstances, modern drug eluting stints, the third generation drug eluting stints was uh, Lotharilumus uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the others. Complete functional revascularization, meaning FFR, the application of FFR, has uh, been able to select out uh, lesions that genuinely require intervention. And modern dual antiplatelet therapy has also mitigated the situation and intensified lipid therapy had, had also its, its contribution. And contemporary biomarker assays have also improvised on, on this situation. So in these circumstances, in the presence of these issues, I think these studies, they need to be repeated. Let me take you to one of our patients who, who presented as a case of uh, demanding unstable angina. This is a 72-year-old diabetic and hypertensive male who presented with typical angina of two years. And in the last one month, the angina deteriorated to, uh, to be precipitated just by a few meters of walk uh, while he was taking aspirin in the high intensity study because he visited even a uh, cardiac setup. This is the angiogram. There is a tight stenosis along the, the, the mid distal circumflex. You can see this. And then the LAD is totally occluded here, right after this diagonal branch. And there is a collateral ascending up. RSA is like this. This is classic three basal disease. It's very tight, tight stenosis at the mid RSA. Then uh, we started uh, working on it. Uh, we chose to intervene first on the RSA. This is because uh, RSA is a, somehow a, a type A lesion, which is amenable to PCI, and uh, that's the most uh, important basal to him. A lady is totally occluded, and the circ is a distal lesion, but this one is very proximal. If it is uh, occluded, it is uh, very detrimental. So the end result was like this. Then we moved immediately to the left, and we did first the circ. Then we started the, the most difficult one, the LAD total occlusion. This is, you know, uh, this is after it has been wired and uh, ballooned once. 
after stating this was the result. Now, let me take you to STEMI. Uh, what makes STEMI different from the rest of the acute coronary syndromes is it should be offered immediate reperfusion therapy in either of two ways, either with primary PCI or fibrinolysis. Reperfusion has been uh, probed very well to improve clinical outcomes if done within 12 hours of the symptom onset. And uh, the, the, the improvements over, over uh, decades has been like this, like in the pre-CCU era, the 30 day mortality was around roughly 30%. That has come to down to 13 to 15% when uh, the CCU era was instituted with defibrillation, hemodynamic monitoring and uh, administration of beta blockers. But currently with reperfusion, uh, including fibrinolysis, PCI, and cabbage, uh, the mortality rate, 30 day mortality has come to uh, between five and 6%. And this was achieved uh, because of the various treatment modalities of uh, reperfusion. The 1990s and uh, early 2000s were uh, uh, somehow achieved by uh, fibrinolysis, but later on, you know, the issue was taken up by uh, PCI. This is because, you know, although fibrinolysis had, uh, the earlier studies have demonstrated an absolute mortality reduction of 33% when fibrinolysis was done within six hours, and then 2% if it is done between seven and 12 hours, whereas, you know, it becomes non-significant if it is done beyond 12 hours. But later, uh, randomized trials have demonstrated even a benefit that ranges between 15 and 30 percent. The various substances that are used as fibrinolytic agents are tenecteplase, reteplase, and others, including streptokinase. And their performance in terms of achieving TB2 and TB3 uh, from where, like, 10K achieves around 85%, TB2 and TB3 together. Rate A plays 84%, whereas streptokinase is limited to 60%. But overall, basal patency remains around 60%, which is uh, quite inferior to uh, PCI. Because uh, studies that have uh, meant to compare uh, PCI and fibrinolysis, a meta-analysis of 23 of them has demonstrated a landslide clear benefit with PCI compared to fibrinolysis when it is done in the first 12 hours. Then the next issue is, if, if, if this difference exists, what about providing PCI for those individuals with failed fibrinolysis? That means a, a kind of combination of them that starts with fibrinolysis and uh, once fibrinolysis is concluded to fail, uh, instituting PCI was, was considered. And uh, one of the studies that has tried to look into it was the REACT trial, which has shown a clear survival benefit with rescue PCI when fibrinolysis fails. And then meta-analysis of uh, such studies has also replicated the same advantage like MI, stroke, days, you know, a composite of them was uh, better with uh, rescue PCI compared to individuals who are remaining with fibrinolysis. So then percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI is more effective, less, and it's uh, associated with less recurrent ischemia, unlike fibrinolysis, and uh, it also shortens hospital stay. But the problem is it requires uh, uh, a lot of experience and it is more expensive. So because of this issue, smaller infarctus, especially limited to the inferior location, in the absence of heart failure, important arrhythmias uh, and uh, contraindications to 
uh, PCI. In these situations, you know, patients could be conservatively managed. Otherwise, you know, institution of uh, PCI, if uh, it is done in the first 12 hours, uh, is uh, quite beneficial. The next important issue is the issue of door to balloon time. Like door to balloon time is the time that the patient arrives to the hospital uh, up to the first ballooning. That shouldn't be greater than 90 minutes. Currently, with the intention of pharmacoinvasive strategy that is stretched up to 120 minutes. Uh, but the other conditions like in patients, patients with high risk of bleeding, those with demanding circumstances like shock, or if the diagnosis is in doubt, uh, or when the fibrinolytic fails, in these circumstances, PCI should always be utilized. So now the most important thing uh, regarding uh, reverse polarization, be it chemical or mechanical, the most important thing is one has to keep in mind that time is muscle, meaning uh, if you look at the necrotic tissue, like in one hour, it's very limited, but as time increases, the, the span of the myocardium that becomes necrotized progressively increases. So because of this, we should always be concerned about time from the time that we have contacted the patient, be it outside or within the hospital. So when it comes to the comparison of uh, PCI with fibrinolysis in terms of time, uh, you know, PCI loses 1% advantage over fibrinolysis with every 10 minutes delay for PCI, uh, waiting for PCI against fibrinolysis. So this, this is an important point that has to be kept in mind uh, when one intends to administer either fibrinolysis or intervention. Uh, when when uh, cardiac survival is seen, if when, when one compares like uh, in this particular study, over 2,300 patients were uh, divided into zero to 90 minutes, 90 to 120 and uh, the others respectively, you know, survival was quite better, cardiac survival was better when PCI was done within 90 minutes compared to uh, 120, 180 or over 180 minutes. This is just to show is uh, in hospital mortality, in hospital mortality progressively increases as time delay increases and that persists up to seven years. Like if the procedure is done uh, in a short time compared to a delayed administration of uh, uh, intervention, you know, that difference persists is defined to persist up to seven years. So the optimal time, the time that it can be stretched, the time that clearly PCI becomes advantageous over fibrinolysis is 114 minutes. That means this is a time between door to balloon, when door to balloon time minus door to needle time, that means administration of fibrinolysis, you know, uh, unless it exceeds 114 minutes in hospitals with PCI facility, it's still advisable to proceed with uh, PCI compared to fibrinolysis. The other option people have to look into is facilitated PCI. There are studies like the ASCENT for uh, PCI that have tried to look into it. This study was early truncated before it finishes its uh, plan for thousand patient recruitment because of landslide benefit in terms of uh, increased days, increased heart failure and shock uh, 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 with patients who were given facilitated PCI, meaning a combination of fibrinolysis and administration of PCI uh, together. So that was not uh, beneficial. And the meta-analysis of studies, including others, uh, was also demonstrating increased short-term mortality, increased non-fatal MI, and uh, increased necessity of target basal revascularization plus stroke was higher uh, in this group of patients who were offered facilitated PCI. So because of this, this is now obsolete. Uh, 
so the other option is, uh, especially in the in the in, in situations like ours where PCI facility in the nearby is uh, quite scanty, uh, there are options like one, regardless of uh, time, just to refer or wait for primary PCI. The other one is ischemia guided transfer of patients. That means fibrinolysis is administered and then when it fails, patients are transferred. And the other option is uh, the new option, pharmacoinvasive strategy. Patients will be given fibrinolytics, like if PCI is not going to be done uh, in a matter of 120 minutes, we'll see it. Uh, the, these patients were, are given fibrinolysis and then immediately transferred for early PCI within two hours up to 24 hours. And there are studies that have tried to look into it. This is the dynamic trial that has compared repeated administration of fibrinolytics with transferring of the patients. And patients who were transferred to PCI facility, these are patients who are presented to hospitals without PCI facility. And in this group of patients, you know, patients who are referred for PCI did better than uh, patients who are uh, who remained with fibrinolytics, even with repeated administration of fibrinolytics. And uh, you know, uh, meta-analysis of uh, such several st studies has concluded that transferring patients is is quite better. And uh, when the registries, like for example, the American registry was seen in a, a time gap, a time difference between uh, door to balloon minus door to needle time up to 120 minutes is advisable to proceed with uh, like if you take if if 120 minutes is exceeded that's the only time fibrinolytics must be administered and then patients uh, referred to a PCI, a PCI center this is because even in america uh, only 36 percent of uh, the hospital setups could achieve this 120 minutes so uh, you know this problem exists uh, everywhere in the world. So in conclusion, PCI-related delays are extensive and are associated with poorer outcomes. No, but no differential excess in mortality even with long PCI-related delays. So that means even this 12 hours uh, time bound is very much blurred with PCI compared to fibrinolysis. It would be erroneous to administer a fibrinolytic beyond 12 hours that PCI can be applied at any time whenever the patient, uh, like, uh, you know, the issue of PCI will be decided after coronary angiography. So any individual who has developed MI must be offered cardiac catheterization. That is uh, the understanding, the teaching today. Uh, but whether to proceed with PCI or not depends on the anatomy that we are uh, going to obtain. And the difference between door to balloon and door to needle times uh, as they increase, mortality advantages of PCI obviously become uh, declining. So let's just uh, look into pharmacoinvasive strategy. This is one of the studies that has looked into it, recruiting over 1,000 patients. Uh, these are, uh, this is a transfer uh, MI patients. Patients were divided the difference between dynamic and transfer MI is patients with fibrinolysis, they were offered rescue PCI, classic rescue PCI. But when they, when they compared them, you know, patients, uh, even fibrinolysis plus rescue PCI could not be uh, equivalent to individuals who were given fibrinolysis and sent for, for PCI. So administration of fibrinolysis and immediate referral for PCI anticipating PCI within two to 24 hours was better than uh, keeping patients with fibrinolysis only offering uh, uh, rescue PCI. And the meta-analysis of such studies has come to a similar conclusion, uh, like especially recurrent myocardial infarction, recurrent ischemia were better with individuals who were routinely intervened 
compared to individuals who are given the facility of uh, uh, fibrinolysis plus rescue PCI. Let's just look into what's happening when uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy is compared to uh, standard treatment. So early PCI after successful fibrinolysis reduces 30 day mortality. And this is uh, uh, also uh, accompanied by reduced infarction, reduced re uh, ischemia. These are the two important circumstances that uh, uh, dictate the benefit of uh, routine PCI compared to uh, fibrinolysis and then uh, and, and, uh, 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 rescue PCI. Uh, and <clears throat> this is achieved without significant increment in terms of bleeding and stroke. That is the most important issue which makes it very, very important. In conclusion, PCI within 24 hours after thrombolysis in STEMI reduces recurrent ischemia, reduces recurrent reinfarction uh, without increment of bleeding risk. Now let's compare a routine PCI with that of uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy. There are studies like this one. This is Garcia, Gracia. Uh, from Spain and uh, Portugal together. It was a small number of patients, but it was uh, comparing even by bio, <coughs> the biomarker uh, positivity and biomarker increment. You know, when they compared individuals who were transferred for, for pharmacoinvasive strategy uh, with that of individuals who just uh, timely, uh, got timely access for uh, PCI, uh, there wasn't any difference in terms of uh, biomarker positivity and clinical outcomes were not also uh, different in this between these two groups in this particular, but the study is uh, smaller, as I said earlier. The standard landmark study in this regard is a stream trial. It has recruited over 1,800 patients. These are patients who presented within the first three hours after the onset of MI and they could not be offered PCI within one hour. When these patients were divided into two, into uh, fibrinolysis uh, uh, plus uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy and standard PCI administration, there was no any difference between the two groups. So now, let, let me take you to one case. This was an individual. A uh, 42 year old uh, smoker who could be given a uh, fibrinolytic in the third hour after uh, MI. And the result, when he was taken to the cat lab the next day, within 24 hours, this was a finding. Still, there is a huge thrombus, although the vessel uh, is open. Uh, it requires uh, intervention. And when we intervened, uh, this was the end result. So, in summary, uh, when it comes to STEMI, we have to be able to do ECG within the first 10 minutes and we have to settle the diagnosis of STEMI because it relies on ECG only. And then uh, these patients, if they are not able to undergo PCI within 120 minutes, they will be offered, they will be given fibrinolytic, like for instance in Ethiopia. Uh, if we are given the opportunity of uh, administering fire, at least the streptokinase in hospitals where we have internists that can be practiced. And then after administration of fibrinolytics, patient is referred. This is a table. This is a conclusion from the European Society of Cardiology. And uh, those patients will be referred uh, for PCI. You know, in between, at the 90 minute time, if Fibrinolysis fails, patient will be urged for pharmacoinvasive strategy, I mean for, for uh, rescue PCI. Uh, immediately, that, that patient requires intervention. Otherwise, if the vessel opens, there will be a plan angiography within two, two, 24 hours. So we can stretch that time up to fairly, and uh, scientifically, we can stretch that time up to 48 hours in our setting, for instance. Well, because 48 hours is a cut point for viability testing. So until uh, a requirement of viability testing uh, sets in, 
we can stretch and still uh, uh, administer PCI. But even then, you know, coronary angiography is always beneficial. One has to see the anatomy and decide because partial occlusions are very common. So in conclusion, in managing acute coronary syndrome, particularly MI, there should be high index of suspicion, which is critically important, and early management of acute coronary syndrome requires facility with defibrillation, different medications, and a capacity to detect and manage complications that is critically important. You know, the telephones of individuals who are managing or looking at uh, uh, such uh, settings, telephones must be open and uh, consultations and communications must be straightforward. Modified pharmacoinvasive strategy, that means up to, 24, up to 48 hours, is a strategy that is applicable and advisable in Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, doctor, for the presentation. Uh, participants, if you have uh, questions regarding the subject matter, uh, please raise your hands and uh, I will allow you to speak one by one and you can ask your question. All right, uh, the next question is from Addis. Uh, can you tell us please your experience with fi uh, fibrinolytics and side effects in our setups? We have a fear of stroke or hypotension, which may not be understandable by patients in their attendance. Yeah, my experience is not... Uh as wide as that of uh, my experience in PCI. Uh, as you all know, these are medications that are coming, uh, uh, they are not coming officially. So the frequency is not that big. Uh, but uh, I have been having some experience in the last uh, 15 years, was in Addis Cardiac Hospital in Gizund. Uh, the only individual I remember is uh, a one who uh, bled intracerebrally, and this one is uh, quite recent, I mean, two months ago. That's the only individual. Huh? Better characterization of patients, better cons consideration of absolute relative contraindications would mitigate uh, the situation. So if patient comes, especially in the first, if we happen to meet the patient in the first two, three hours, and somehow we are not able to institute PCI for that particular individual, Unless there are absolute contraindications, we should not hesitate to offer him streptokinase. That is, that is my experience. Because uh, tenecteplase and reteplase, they are not uh, very, very common. Uh, they are very sporadic. So the one which is relatively commonly obtained is streptokinase that, yeah, that can be administered in the way I tried to characterize the circumstances. In my, that's my experience, what my experience is. All right, uh, the next question is from Lydia. Uh, what level of highly sensitive troponin is said to be high to diagnose MI? Or in other words, how many times should the troponin rise to diagnose MI? You know, it, it depends on the cut point of that particular assay. You know, uh, somebody cannot, uh, any, any, any uh, elevation, beyond the limit must be considered seriously. Uh, because troponin positivity is the most serious matter in terms of uh, coronary issue. Because the prognostic implication, the mortality, the incurred mortality behind is so serious. So uh, once it exits, the assay should be dependable. You have to choose a very good assay. And then if there is significant elevation, you should be concerned. Even there are individuals who are concerned when, you know, within the range, if there is increment that, that has that it's that has some implication on its own. So uh, any increment should be uh, seriously considered. Uh, okay. Uh, so another one is from Bali Adal. What should be done if it's late? If it's late or greater than 120 minutes, 
uh, what other options are in the case of non-available non fibrolysis in PCI? Conservative <clears throat> medical treatment composed of proper administration of aspirin, like the first dose of aspirin should, should be at least 160 milligrams. It should be chewed for immediate buccal absorption. 300 milligrams of clopidogrel should be administered and the patient should receive unfractionated heparin. It should be available. Uh, then uh, patient must be offered oxygen, IV access, ECG monitoring. These are important issues. And we, uh, the professionals, must be able to detect and treat heart failure, arrhythmia, recurrent ischemia. We should be able to detect. So in that, in that situation, we can manage them conservatively. When I was a resident or uh, early in my professional track, we were managing patients uh, conservatively. It's, it's only 15 years ago I started to do intervention. And uh, I did not have any chance to apply it for uh, every individual because it's very costly. So there are patients, there are still patients who are managed, huge number of patients who are managed conservatively. But if the opportunity exists at any level, coronary angiography must be attempted in individuals who developed MI. Uh, okay, so the next one is from Amara Hailakiros. And the question is how, how frequent you do CABG for failed pharmacological and PCI recanalization? How do you rule out uh, prinzimental uh, agina for steam without doing cardiac enzyme? Uh, failed PCI. Uh, you know, you will have a very good judgment before you intervene. So the only circumstances, uh, like if you have uh, all uh, the required facility, uh, failure of PCI is not a common thing. Uh, so it's not uh, like, for instance, um, in the study I was referring to from Gizund, the first uh, 197 patients, we achieved uh, TIMI3 in 86% of them. And when TIMI2 is added, it exceeded over 95%. And these are not individuals who are uh, dedicated for, the remaining ones are not uh, meant for coronary bypass surgery. Uh, this is usually with acute ST elevation MI, the no reflow phenomenon. This is what, knows, what is known as no reflow, reflow phenomenon. Uh, otherwise, failure of PCI is not, uh, is not very, that very big uh, today. If the vessel is otherwise to benefit from uh, intervention, it will be pre-decided that those patients will be, depending on the syntax score, they will be dedicated to, to coronary bypass surgery right from the start. That is a classic way of going into it. Okay, great. And uh, prismetal angina, vasospastic angina is very, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there are uh, MIs and manifestations in the absence of obstructive lesion. Prismetal angina can exist both in the presence of obstructive lesion or in the absence. Coronary microvascular dysfunction is becoming an important and attractive area as well. So these are circumstances very difficult to diagnose. Uh, it requires a high index of suspicion and we should apply. Patients who are complaining of uh, uh, something what looks like uh, uh, prismetal or vasospastic angina, they must undergo uh, investigations uh, like the ones I mentioned, functional or anatomic uh, verifications must, must be carried out. If there is a lesion, those patients may, may know significant lesion, the lesion has to be treated accordingly. Uh, if there are no lesions, medications like uh, beta blockers, non-dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers, nitrates, and the new ones like ranolazine, which is currently available in our country, 
it, which is a late sodium current uh, uh, inhibitor, it reduces intracellular sodium and in effect intracellular calcium, uh, which, which treats the demand side, it, it, it treats the angina. Uh, Nicorandil could be utilized. Trimethazidine is also uh, available, which is a, a fuel efficient uh, anti ischemic um, treatment, which means it switches from beta oxidation to glucose oxidation, which is uh, fuel efficient, meaning in terms of oxygen, and uh, it reduces angina. So those medications could be utilized in this circumstance if the coronary angiography does not show any obstructive lesion in, in the epicardial coronary arteries. Okay, so we'll just ask uh, two questions after this and we'll uh, proceed to the quiz section. Uh, this, one, uh, this one is from uh, Fiametta. So what are the contradictions, uh, contraindications of anticoagulants in MI? Uh, and another one is when do we use B blockers? We said plus or minus on the presentation. And when do we differ it in one? In another words, the, co the contraindications of B blockers in MI. Contraindications well, of uh, anticoagulants in general. If there is active bleeding, we shouldn't administer it. Uh, but it depends on the reason of uh, the bleeding and the location of the bleeding. Uh, if the advantage of a particular medication outweighs its drawback, you may be called on to intervene. Uh, uh, like, I remember a patient uh, who had uh, permanent thromboembolism, and there was a thrombus in transit uh, at the right atrium, but at the same time, patient has developed intracellular breathing. And then, you know, out of desperation, I acted with unfractionated heparin. Because I thought by then uh, it was, you know, it's relatively simpler to discontinue un unfractionated heparin because of its shorter half life as compared to low molecular heparin. That was why I chose it. Uh, and that patient survived somehow. So there are circumstances whereby you need to choose between two devils. Uh, otherwise, if there is active bleeding conventionally, the advantage is a kind of uh, uh, there one, one can omit administration of uh, anticoagulation. Like in the presence of a small MI in the inferior one, I may just uh, dedicate the circumstance to aspirin and clopidogrel or even aspirin alone, especially in the absence of intervention. So uh, it's always, it requires, everything cannot be put in a guideline. So it, it requires our judgment. And the uh, other one was, uh, what, what, what did you say? The next component of a question, yeah, beta blocker. Beta blockers, uh, there are a lot of questions on uh, IV administration of beta blockers. Uh, like uh, in studies like the acuity trial, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, issues, especially related to shock. Uh, it is customary, uh, you know, to administer this cocktail of medications like AC limiters, beta blockers, and the nitrate in patient uh, becomes uh, in a state of shock. Uh, like in the evening, when uh, the patient develops uh, acute MI, acute ST elevation MI, a young individual with occlusion of proximal LED and extensive anterior MI, the initial response is increased adrenergic drive, the heart rate will be high, blood pressure is spuriously high, even individuals who are not uh, hypertensive. Then uh, resident, some residents they indulge with uh, lots of the drugs I, 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 uh, I have been uh, mentioning. And then in the morning, patient's blood pressure is so low. Uh, and then patient becomes so fatigued, uh, even the heart failure state worsens. So one has to be careful in the beginning. You have to calm him down, administration, uh, administer uh, anxiolytics, uh, if provide him 
with oxygen if the oxygen saturation is less than 90 percent and then gates uh, draw his attention uh then uh, you know everything settles down before moving or rushing with 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 beta blockers they were demonstrated to reduce in fact expansion rhythm disturbance even mortality but though there are earlier studies before optimal medical treatment uh, has been optimized further so we shouldn't embark a lot on uh, beta blockers uh, at this time all right the thank you. must be safe okay all right thank you so much dr abakala uh, before you go if you have any uh, last regards that you would like to mention uh, uh, i give you the stage i am so happy when uh, blue hills with this uh, number of uh, audience uh, provides me the opportunity uh, because uh, uh, as an academician i believe it's my duty to try to educate my uh, uh, juniors uh, and if possible colleagues uh, so that is uh, the intention i have and uh, i have tried my best and i wish you all the best Oh, 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 oh,